Um, good afternoon and welcome to CSIS. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We have a great program. Today's events um, are part of the CSIS Commission on Strengthening America's Health Security, uh, a two-year effort that we launched April 17th. It's co-chaired former Senator Kelly Ayotte a a and former CDC Director Julie Gerberding includes four members of Congress, includes General Carter Hamm, who's kindly agreed to join us today. General, thank you so much. Uh, it also includes uh, a small number of, of expert advisors, including Beth Cameron, who's so kindly given us time today to moderate the panel that you'll be hearing uh, momentarily. Pandemic preparedness is one of our high priorities uh, uh, over this two-year period. We'll be doing a stream of activities similar to this that cover a range of issues, including global disorder, which of course this topic lends itself to that, uh, countermeasures, changes in biotechnology. Uh, and so please uh, keep your eyes open. We'll be doing a stream of work over the course of the next two years that fit in those themes and those topical areas. Uh, we're delighted today that we could do this event in collaboration with uh, DAI and Fondation Merieu uh, with their support and their sponsorship of this event. Uh, Jerry Martin uh, and Christopher Legrand from DAI, very integral in bringing this uh, to our attention and making the case that uh, together with Guy Vernet uh, from the Fondation, that it was a very good time to hold an event of this, of this type uh, on the anniversary, 100th anniversary of the Spanish uh, flu, 1918 Spanish flu, uh, on the eve of the opening of a major new exhibit at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. We're joined here today by the curator of that exhibit, Sabrina Schultz. Thank you, Sabrina, for joining us, who will speak at the end of the program about this exciting um, new exhibit, Outbreak Epidemics in a Connected World. But most importantly, this was well-timed because it offers us the opportunity to hear from the administration around the future and it's how it's looking at the future, and also to hear from three experts that DAI and Fondation Merieux were able to bring to our attention, bring two of those personalities here in person, uh, Amadou Sal and Andrew Ketua. Thank you both for journeying here to be with us. We seldom have the opportunity to see either of them here and CSIS, so this is very unusual. We'll be joined in the panel discussion remotely uh, by Ann, <coughs> excuse me, by David Heyman uh, of Chatham House, who will be coming to us from Geneva, and, and, and David is a close friend and colleague and, and, and very well known to all of us who work in this particular field. Um, I want to, before I say a few uh, framing remarks, I want to offer special thanks to a number of people who made quite a contribution in pulling this event together. Uh, from CSIS, uh, Emily Munden, Alexand uh, Ashwari Araje, Alexander Bush, uh, Travis Hopkins. Um, from DAI, uh, Susan uh, Schribner, Natalie Domond, and a Anna Caudill. And from uh, Fondation Merieux, uh, Emily Penrose. As I mentioned, special thanks to close friend and ally Beth Cameron for agreeing to moderate the panel and to help us with the commission. Our purpose today is really to put a focus on both policy formulation, U.S. policy, and also on practice, on implementation, and on thinking beyond Washington, which David, I think, will help pull us in, as well as Andrew and Amadou. We want to take account of where we are today in the efforts that grew out of Ebola and other outbreaks in building capacities, where those capacities are weakest and where the risks and vulnerabilities are high. We want to ask ourselves what have we learned and, and what are the remaining outstanding challenges and be very forward-looking, future-oriented in terms of what are going to need to be the top-line priorities as we look ahead for the next several years, both in terms of policy and strategic goals and in terms of the implementation approaches that we take in building capacities with partners uh, in various settings. Um, Ebola propelled us forward, 
Uh, that tragic set of events triggered in num numerous, at least seven studies. They all concluded, they all had some common conclusions around fixing WHO, around investing in capacities, and particularly in low-income countries and lower-middle-income countries, and changing our approach to research and development. Uh, and it boosted the Global Health Security Alliance the global health security agenda, adding $1 billion in U.S. emergency funds to build capacities and to motivate others to join. And it put forward the centrality of U.S. leadership and the centrality of a common metric and measurement and assessment of, of national capacities and create the incentives for national plans and for putting forward actions to implement and create those capacities. Now we're finding a much higher focus on sustaining those financial and political commitments. Uh, we're in a period in which the threat has waned, although in just recent days, we're seeing the recurrence uh, of Ebola and the outbreak in DRC, and we'll have a chance to talk a bit more about that in the course of the discussions. We are at uh, a, an important moment. I'll skip on the discussion around what's happening in DRC until we have an opportunity to discuss that with Luciana uh, uh, Borio. Um, we have a full and very rich program. We're opening with a presentation by Dr. Borio on U.S. policy, now and looking ahead. That'll be followed by an hour-long panel moderated by Beth and featuring David, Andrew, and Amadou. At the and then at the conclusion, we'll ask Sabrina to uh, come and do a quick presentation with some slides on the exhibit, and thereafter invite Chris Legrand from DAI and and Guy Vernet to welcome us and introduce the next phase, which is a reception that will be held here out on the, out on the patio. Dr. Borio serves as the Director of Medical and Biodefense Preparedness Policy at the National Security Council. Previously, she served in a series of senior positions at the Food and Drug Administration, where she had responsibilities in counterterrorism and medical countermeasures. Uh, she served for a number of years at the University of Pittsburgh's Center for Biosecurity and served as an advisor on biodefense programs at the Department of Health and Human Services. She holds a medical degree from George Washington University, and I want to say just personally, in the six months that led up to the launch of the uh, CSIS commission that I referenced earlier, uh, Lou and her colleagues at the White House were ex exceedingly generous within their time in participating in the seven different roundtables that we held in that period to try and get some soundings and advice around how to best orient the work of that commission over the two years. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Boria. So, well, good afternoon, everyone. And I want to thank you again for the invitation to be here. It's really a pleasure to be here today uh, with all of you. And I want to thank Steve and CSIS and other partners who make this possible because this work is so critical. And we engage in all those roundtables because um, we, this work is essential uh, for the work that we are trying to achieve collaboratively as a community. So. Very important, and thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to the second part of today's event uh, as an audience member and also getting a sneak peek, sneak peek in the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History new exhibition, which I think is going to be fantastic, and outbreaks, epidemics in a connected world. So I think it's going to open tomorrow formally, and I'm really looking forward to that. So uh, in case they take me out of the podium because I'm over time, I'll tell you that my four key points are that global health programs are foundational to global health security. And within the context of global health security, we have the global health security agenda, which provides a very robust framework to achieve our global health security goals. And I also think it's important, and that's mostly because of the title of the event, that I think it's important for us to begin to distinguish a bit between epidemic and pandemic threats. Um, they are both equally important, equally serious, equally claim lives, but I think some of the tools that we have to address them are a bit, some of, there's some distinctions in the tools that we address them. 
and of course, very few diseases pose true pandemic threats. Um, and then one that is very near to my heart as a physician is that health is really one of the most important determinants of human well-being. And if the well-being of its citizens is what matters, it's really fundamental to national security. So, you know, health is national security. Um, in terms of global health programs, much of the success we've achieved in global health security has been built on this foundation that was laid out by our major global health and development programs, and we need to recognize those. When the Ebola outbreak began in West Africa in 2014, much of our capacity to respond in Nigeria came from the hundreds of polio workers that had been already deployed and trained in the area. And the polio program contributed not only through increased lab capacity and surveillance systems, but on the ground knowledge provided by the community health workers who really knew the roads, the villages, people, and their customs. So it's impossible to separate these, these types of programs. And investments in HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, polio, and childhood immunization programs also have contributed to epidemiologists and lab capacity, health information systems, and clinicians. So these are all core capacities that are essential for epidemic response. Routine local public health infrastructure is at the core of any global health security system. And the billions of dollars that the United States invests in HIV, TB, malaria, and other programs are and remain essential to the US and to global health security. Now, it surprises me how many people see the glass as being half empty and think that we are falling behind on global health when, as a matter of fact, of data, the opposite is true. The world is doing dramatically better in measures of poverty, literacy, child mortality, and vaccination. We should celebrate those achievements, and if you have any questions about the data to support the statistics, I'll be glad to talk to you after the event. But they're solid. Um, but, you know, of course, you're trying to go to the last mile. This last mile, I mean, of course, I know it's many, many miles, not really just a mile, but it will take enormous commitment and focus. It's the hardest part of this trajectory. And achieving these incremental goals on top of marked successes and substantial achievements may appear as if we're losing ground. But data shows the opposite is true. So now on to more global health security. Um, the health of the American people depends on our ability to stop disease outbreaks at their source, wherever they occur, before they spread globally. That was one of the impetus for the global health security agenda that was launched by my colleague Beth Cameron um, just a few years ago and has made dramatic progress. So we advance this capability through the global health security agenda, and it really helps countries develop the capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious diseases. It's so simple, this idea that we prevent, detect, response. It sounds so simple today, but those three words are not part of the core vocabulary for what we really mean for, you know, what's global health security, and now it is. Everybody knows that we're talking about prevention, detection, response. Um, to formalize our strategy in global health security, we're preparing a global health security strategy, as it was called for in our 2018 omnibus budget, and we welcome the strategy. It will give us an opportunity to further elaborate on our goals. So as if you know, on May 8th, the DRC confirmed an outbreak of Ebola virus disease in the Bukuru area of the Equatorial province, which is Northwest DRC, which was followed by confirmation by the INRB, the Institut Nacional de Research Biomedical in Kinshasa. This was same day testing, they confirmed this, the, the outbreak. And remarkably, well, WHO responded very fast, as did the DRC and international partners, such as MSF. Everybody moved so fast. Um, and our own CDC and USAID rapidly mobilized to provide support for their response. USAID deployed personal protective equipment and laboratory assets. The CDC is deploying staff, offering technical assistance and a range of activities. And 
I think the tragic events of 2014 are so still close in our uh, in the timelines that a lot of the same people that worked on that tragic, tragic ev epidemic are now working on this epidemic, and the relationships are still very fresh. But let's look back at what DRC accomplished last year when they contained an outbreak of Ebola in 42 days, and in part, this was thanks to U.S. health security investments in the DRC, which helped strengthen the country's ability to respond rapidly to infectious disease outbreaks. And today, there are about 150 field epidemiologists running program graduates in the DRC. We call them disease detectives, and they're well-placed to assi assist with this current outbreak. These capacities did not exist a while ago, just a few years ago. And these investments are so key to our global prosperity and security. The U.S. has been contributing to GHSA by investing $1 billion over five years in 17 at-risk countries with the key goal of building their capacity to respond to outbreaks domestically. And other countries had followed suit, and we are so grateful for their support. Just to name a few, we have Finland and Canada, Australia and Korea, but others as well. And it's so true, I think, that GHSA would not have been launched without the U.S. leadership. But it is not an American program. It's a global resource. And like many global resources, they need to be nurtured by all countries who believe that health security is vital to our collective interest. This is an investment that we all should be making because the effects of failure will not be contained at any of our borders. And the human suffering that it entails is immeasurable. Here at home, we are developing a national by defense strategy, and we have not yet completed it past due. But that's because we want to do it right. And to do it right, it takes time. We are committed to making our biodefense enterprise more efficient and effective. The national biodefense strategy that we are working on will be comprehensive in many, many ways. By threat, it will encompass naturally occurring, accidental, and deliberate biological threats that affect the national security of the United States. By tar target, because it will address threats to humans, plants, animals, and the environment. By geography, because it will deal with incidents both here in the United States and also abroad in the spirit of GHSA. And by discipline, the strategy will take a multi-sectoral approach addressing, addressing health, emergency response, science and technology, law enforcement, defense and security, intelligence, non-proliferation, and counter-proliferation sectors, among others. Many stakeholders have called for a more efficient, coordinated, and accountable biodefense enterprise in the United States. And we are developing this strategy to answer that call. Now, I mentioned earlier that I think it's important to draw a distinction between epidemics and pandemics. And the one that I worry the most uh, in my day-to-day -day is the threat of a pandemic influenza. Because most diseases that we are dealing on a day-to-day -day basis, we need, we have, if we don't do it, we really ought to contain it at at the earliest possible time point. There is no excuse for these diseases becoming pandemics. But some diseases, we know that it's going to be very difficult to prevent them from becoming pandemics. And that's really our number one health security concern, is the threat of pandemic influenza. It's a disease that can circle the globe in a little, as little as two weeks, and we just can't contain it at the source. And we have made significant strides since the last pandemic, but we must continue our efforts to get to a much better place. And one of the top priorities we have is to shorten the time for a vaccine to become available for the broader population. And I know that federal departments and agencies are working to evaluate options that could address this challenge. Uh, separately, um, it is a global responsibility to prepare for these diseases. And one challenge that we continue to face is the idea of um, the uh, access to viral samples. And vaccine producing countries like the US really need access to virus of pandemic potential to monitor viral evolution, to conduct risk assessment, and to fully test countermeasures that are being developed. And bureaucratic hurdles continue to impede the rapid sharing of viral samples. China, for example, hasn't shared the most recent strains of H7 and 9 virus, despite multiple requests. And we are working to find a solution to this serious problem. 
But again, in the spirit of collective responsibility, that's one that needs to go on the top of the list for governments. And there's an international dimension to flu, of course, as with any health security issue. And I'll just make a pitch that improving disease surveillance efforts and expanding annual flu vaccination in low and middle income countries are gonna be very important for, for well-being and for pandemic readiness because they will give us the head start we need to vaccinate populations, to distribute vaccine in the event of a pandemic. So in closing, I'd like to again, thank you for your work, uh, Steve, and the commission's work. It really is critical to continue to draw public attention to the need for strong biodefense and for proposing recommendations for reducing biological risks. We know that there are very many competing priorities and problem sets, uh, but this administration is focused on and committed to global health security. So I wanna end by thank you again for your work, uh, for convening this critical meeting, for keeping these issues at the forefront, and for bringing uh, special expertise and experience to bear to help us strengthen America health security. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Luciana. Um, when we launched this commission back in April 17th, there was a closed door session up in the Senate for a few hours, and then there was a session later in the evening in which I think it was 16 different representatives of the administration from different agencies participating in a conversation, which was very encouraging that there was so much interaction and common ground and a, a comfort level and trust in trying to talk about how to collaborate in thinking about the future. And so thank you for, for, for all of the, the good work you've done and for you and your colleagues' openness and receptivity to cooperating in that fashion. Another thing that came across, particularly in the, in the afternoon closed door session, but was voiced by Congressman Cole over dinner that evening was the desire coming from within Congress for on a bipartisan basis. I mean, we have two senators, two House members split evenly between Republicans and Democrats uh, saying that they feel the need and, the, and a ripeness in trying to bring forward to their colleagues within Congress a kind of vision of, for the future that would place health security within a doctrine of national security that would convincingly and concisely sort of capture that and place, situate it. I think Congressman Cole kept referring back to the sort of containment strategy of Kennan uh, in the, in the post-war period vis-a-vis -vis the Soviets. I mean, he's a historian. He's thinking historically. He's thinking about this moment in time. There was also a call for establishing some milestones, some very ambitious goals over a five or 10 year period, and, 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 and trying to link those to manageable but robust incremental advances in budget commitments, and something that would um, give the view out in the next five to 10 years on if we made a really uh, expanded effort what, what threats would be taken off the table? What would the achievements be in that period? And part of it also are the issues around how do we coordinate ourselves internally and how do we create the kind of sustained leadership? So I was, I was very struck by that. I wasn't really expecting that there was going to be such a strong sentiment so clearly expressed by both Democrats and Republicans in our commission coming from the Hill and a desire really to use that to expand the learning and the support coming from among colleagues and the like. So I just wanted to ask you, from where you sit, what, what response or advice do you have to us in trying to answer that call for this type of work? I mean, there's lots, of, you've got a national biodefense strategy that's in formulation, you have a, the omnibus instructions, there's lots of thinking going on in different places. But for us, what would be your advice? So I go back to, is it going to achieve the prevent, detect, and response framework? You know, go back to the simplicity of yes. it all. 
is that, are, you know, we know what the, what needs to be done, and it clearly is a whole of government and a whole of, it's with Congress involvement and with experts around. So I'll tell you, like, for the, for the national by defense strategy that we are, you know, working, um, most of the federal government plays a, such a significant role in health security and biodefense, but so does many, many other entities that are beyond the federal government. Mm -hmm. So here we are, you know, coordinating policy, integrating policy at the federal level, and how do we incorporate that entire ecosystem of biodefense in the work we do? So um, when you ask me, like, what is that the advice uh, is that you need to be part of this because, for example, at the NSC, when we coordinate and integrate the work of the departments and agencies, it's really much at the federal level. So there is a limit to that ecosystem that we reach, mm -hmm. um, which is why your work is, again, so, how many times have I thanked you for it? It's so critical um, to, be, to promote this dialogue to, in, to make sure that all the different participants and stakeholders are fully engaged, that we are coordinated, we are working towards this common goal of prevent, detect, and response. Should I talk some more? <laughs> I can we're, go. We're having some problems here, but I think they're being fixed. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so I'll just, you know, we were at the, there was a tabletop exercise, this was last week, put out by the Thank center, you. the Hopkins Center for Health Security. And it was really interesting that um, your comments reminded me of, uh, somebody made a comment that it, we need to make sure that biodefense is not the number 11 on everybody's top 10 list of problems. Right. And. Um, and so it's very encouraging when we have members of Congress also talking about how important this is, because the goal is to really bring it from number 11 to, to the top 10 list. Right. Yeah. Let me come back to the response that we're, uh, that's unfolding in front of us with respect to Ebola in Bekoro in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, you referenced this. It, in some ways, it's very encouraging to see the pattern of response, even though this remains a very dangerous situation and an uncertain situation and one that we need to be very careful and cautious in thinking about and, and very vigilant. And I think lots of people are, in fact, being very vigilant on their toes. But we had this, this, this cycle by comparison with 2014. We had remarkable, remarkable mobilization of leadership. Dr. Tedros, Peter Salama, mm -hmm. Dr. Moetti, we had the Minister and President, Minister of Health and President Kabila of DRC engaged. We had WFP come in and create a, an air bridge in a critically important um, air bridge. We had contingency funding released both from WHO and on the vaccine deployment coming from Wellcome Trust and DFID, the UK foreign aid. And the um, other agencies, US CDC, USAID, the new, newly formed Africa CDC, playing a role, sort of full spectrum of groups arriving pretty rapidly on the scene, and the, and the putting in place of these, this playbook that became familiar during Ebola 2014 of isolation, of contact tracing, surveillance, uh, safe burial practices, and a very strong emphasis on communications and transparency. So there's been a lot of learning in this period. Many of the people that are actively engaged in executing are people who were on the ground. Amadou, who we'll hear from in a moment, two years in Guinea, uh, and during that uh, response period. There are things we don't know. We don't know when this started. We don't know where it, where it will migrate and how much the waterways of the Ubangi and Congo River will, will facilitate transmission or not. We know there's one case in a heavily urbanized area, Mbandaka. Um, but we still have, I think it's still a moment of in, to be encouraged. And I wanted to ask you, you were involved in, in, in some of the scientific and clinical work and studies that were undertaken in the midst of that crisis. And the, the, what was learned in that period is now being carried forward in, way, in very important ways that to a non-specialist may not be entirely understood or visible. Can you say a bit about like sure. what came out of that extensive investment during and after in the, in the exploration yeah. and, and studies that were done? Sure, so those were such difficult times in 2014 when you go back and you know, we 
uh, there was such human tragedy, tragedy uh, you know, unfolding, and it, the lack of coordination, the lack of uh, speed and agility, you know, they all became evident uh, because, again, we were not ready to respond as I think we are today. We hadn't had those lessons learned and we hadn't figured this out. I mean, I was, and I'll talk about the studies in a minute, but I was like also impressed how the cold chain equipment arrived in the DRC before the vaccine even landed. Uh, that was impressive. And right. maintaining cold chain at negative 70 degrees Celsius for a vaccine like that is no easy task right. in the DRC. But we already know that that's gonna, it's gonna take that. and we, So I think that going back to uh, the early days of Ebola, you know, there were very many uh, medical countermeasures vaccines and drug candidates and uh, even diagnostic tests that were still in very much early development. And the demand, the desire to rapidly deploy them to contain the outbreak was understood. But for some, there were not even many, much quantity to really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And um, some of us, including myself, we really felt that it was really important to deploy them in a very um, deliberate way so that we could learn uh, from the experience and really assess what was going to help people, what might hurt people, what was not going to be worthwhile, because we knew that this, what was unfold, this is not, not likely going to be the last epidemic of Ebola that we would be facing, and that there was this great desire to say, let's do it better next time. Let's learn. So I think at the time it was, we saw that as almost like a competing, can we respond or can we learn? And I think we can do both, and we did both. Uh, there were several remarkable studies that were conducted in the field during very difficult circumstances, during the epidemic, and we learned a wealth of information about those medical products, some that were deemed very promising, did not turn out to be helpful at all. Others were tur turned out to be uh, quite important. And of course, the vaccine that we have today right. is you know, thanks to a remarkable study that the WHO conducted uh, in Guinea, uh, which was a ring vaccine study. And it showed, it really demonstrated uh, the benefit of a vaccine in the way it was administered. So we can't lose sight of the importance of actually at least having some of the people uh, that are not necessarily in the, you know, thinking about how we're going to get the cold chain. They're thinking about how we're going to maximize our knowledge base in this response so that we can help every future patient that may be impacted as well. Um, but it was, so it's, it's very gratifying to see where we are. Thank you. Just the, this exercise, uh, Clade okay. X exercise that Johns Hopkins University, Tom Inglesby, uh, organized with his team earlier this week, um, two days ago, uh, here in Washington, which was a, a very elaborate and very impressive uh, effort that brought together, and there will be reporting on this in the media, brought together a, you know, a high-level group to simulate a major dangerous outbreak. And one of the conclusions from that, from that effort was in the absence of a vaccine, you were really in, stuck, right? <laughs> that you, you know you could you could take all sorts of other measures but without that you kept coming back to my gosh we're really in deep trouble here and so to to go through that exercise and then to be reading about the the the, the rush to deploy the vaccine into congo there was a kind of interesting uh, 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 interplay between those two realities and in, in the space of like two days the vaccine really helps, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, I feel like the, you know, with the, with the case, um, the new case in the more, more urban area, I feel like, well, I, I, I told folks that, you know, it's almost like, you know, we, got, we hit some turbulence and uh, it's too soon to know the, the extent of the epidemic. We still collect that information. But I feel like if I have to guess, you know, it's a turbulent uh, component of the trip, but I think that the plane is gonna land safely sooner or later because we have the systems in place, we have a vaccine, and we know how to, how to tackle this. Um, I, but you know, you bring up a point about this demand for countermeasures and vaccines, and then sometimes we forget the importance of just caring for patients and providing very good medical care, which of course can be very difficult in um, certain areas. But that's also something that has to be built into the response is how do we optimize the medical care? Because medical care is a beautiful thing, and supportive medical care can really save many lives. Um, 
and we ought to be doing that better, not only globally, but also domestically in the case we have a very large a disease outbreak. Uh, we saw during the flu season, seasonal flu this year, how hospitals had to put tents up and to care for their patients. It didn't take much to be able to, to bring them to that. And you know, I'm a glass half full person because you saw that, you know, let's mm -hmm. celebrate achievements. And I thought that was a good sign that they had these tents because that means that they planned ahead and they had their plans in place to be able to take care of excess patients, of course. Some people think that was terrible, that it showed that you know, the system couldn't handle the surge. Uh, but medical care is um, foundational as well and may not be as interesting as a new vaccine or a drug, but it's also part isn't that of one it. of the, isn't that one of the lessons learned during the Ebola outbreak in the study, field studies in terms of survivability? Absolutely. That and, um, survivability increased dramatically with the basic provision of healthcare. Dramatically, and one of the studies that were conducted in Liberia uh, and Sierra Leone and eventually Guinea uh, had a, a, a medical care arm, so without intervention of any, any specific drug. And the outcomes were not as good as when drug was administered, ZMAP was administered, but they were much better than we had been experiencing um, before the, the standardized provision of medical care through a clinical trial. It was remarkable, the, the survival rate, given what we had learned to expect, you know, this virtually 100% mortality. Um, but it wasn't the case when medical care was provided. So we can save a lot of people if we can do it better. Thank you. So thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing this time. We look forward to the, to the new strategy, and we look forward for continuing engagement. Thank you so much thank for being you. with us. Thanks for everything you do. <laughs> We're going to move to the next phase of the afternoon. Beth, if you could come on up with your Partners. Sorry, unmute. My apologies. I'm going to do. Sorry. Dave, we're going to need another chair. Dr. David Heyman, uh, Dr. Amadou Sal, and Dr. Andrew Katua. And we're going to begin the program with just a few minutes of introduction from each speaker to provide their perspectives on preparedness. We're going to talk uh, amongst ourselves a little bit. We're going to have a little bit of hopefully a provocative conversation about the challenges that face us today in epidemic and pandemic preparedness. And then we're really hoping to hear from all of you. So please be thinking in the back of your heads um, what questions you might want to ask us, uh, what you want to learn from our panelists. And I'd just like to say up front before I introduce uh, our first speaker that these three panelists, um, first of all, I'm very humbled to be on a panel with each of them, but they all have extensive experience on the ground, controlling outbreaks, working in the field. And I think what I'm hoping to really elicit today and to hear um, from each of you and then uh, from the questions is how are we really doing? How prepared are we? And what kinds of approaches are working in communities around the world? And where are we not quite where we need to be? And what practically and concretely could we be doing to improve that? So I'd like to begin um, to, by introducing someone who needs very little introduction uh, to many of you in this community, if that's true for all of our speakers. Um, Professor Dr. David Heyman, he's currently the head of the Center of Health Security at Chatham House in London. He's also a professor of infectious disease epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and of course the chairman of Public Health England. And David previously served in many roles, including at the World Health Organization, as the Assistant Director General for Health Security and the Environment. Um, he also, of course, helped head the global response to SARS and was part of the WHO team that eradicated smallpox. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce David Heyman to you. He joins us by video link from Geneva. David. Thanks very much, Beth. Um, and I'm really sorry I can't be with you today. In fact, I was in Geneva in order to meet with 
the World Economic Forum and the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers because both those groups are trying to figure out their space in this, this fight against global health security or fight for global health security. And it's the same as it was last week at WHO when I was at a meeting with Amadou, who was there as well, where we tried to call attention to all the goodwill that really the most important is not to build up global mechanisms, but to strengthen country capacity. And that's considered very important by us all. That's why the International Health Regulation Revision put the emphasis on rapid detection and response when and where outbreaks occur. Instead of trying to stop disease at borders, get in there and really do the job. I think today what we're seeing is a remarkable uh, response to an Ebola outbreak. This is the eighth in DRC. And I think DRC has shown that they can stop these outbreaks on their own. The added advantage, as we heard earlier now, is that there can be some research and development going on in that outbreak. So it's very important the world has really advanced to an area where they can be ready to do the research that's necessary to develop new diagnostic tests or vaccines or medications or antibody preparations to take care of, of people who are sick. So that's what's really important in today's world, to focus people on countries, not on these global mechanisms. It's time we stop saying we will stop the outbreak. It's time to start saying we will facilitate countries' react reactivity to stop outbreaks. And that's why the, the joint external assessments are so important. And I was just out in, in the Asian um, region with the Pacific, Indo and Pacific uh, Center for Global Health Security of the Australian government. We were doing a scoping mission to see what's going on in these countries as far as health security. And I have to say it's very interesting to see and very rewarding to see that these countries are volunteering to have joint external assessments. They're then developing what they feel are the plans they need and they're budgeting those plans. The weak point, however, is that those plans are not being funded in any meaningful way by the development agencies. It's always easy to mobilize resources to react when an outbreak occurs, but it's very difficult for countries to get that money into their infrastructure. So I'll stop there. I'll just say that I think the world has made great strides in both the global health security agenda in the revised international health regulations and in the WHO, which has a director general who's very responsive to the needs of the countries. Tedros will tell you that universal health coverage and health security are two parts of the same coin. They're, they're two sides of the same coin, and they really are. If people can't be taken care of during an outbreak, or if there's more malaria that occurs than the outbreak disease itself because health systems break down, health security is not being met. Health security has both an individual component and a global component. So I'll thank you, Beth, for having me speak. Thank you uh, for having me come in to, to this meeting today. Thank you so much. And we'll come back to several of those points. I think it will be interesting to discuss uh, many of them. And, and thank you for bringing in your recent focus in Australia. I definitely want to ask you a little bit more about what you saw um, out there in your recent work. Um, Next, we have Dr. Amadou Sal, and he is the director of the Institute Pasteur in Dakar, Senegal, and also the director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Arboviruses and Hemorrhagic, Viral Hemorrhagic Fevers, very topical uh, today and, and every day. He's trained as a virologist, has a PhD in public health, and he's worked all over the world. I won't list all of the countries, but it's almost every continent, except maybe Antarctica. I didn't see that one. <laughs> Um, his research is focused on diagnostics, ecology, evolution of arboviruses, and of course, viral hemorrhagic fevers. And he was also, as Steve mentioned, the lead scientist for Institute Pasteur Dakar's team that deployed um, in Guinea for the Ebola response in 2014. Welcome. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, just uh, in line with what David was saying, I think uh, it's a very important at this stage uh, when it comes to preparedness to realize that uh, probably we are doing extremely well in some regards. But uh, when we look at what's happening with Ebola, but still, when I look at it from uh, the perspective on the field, there are few challenges that are very important. And from those challenges, uh, I can see over the last 24 years, 
four that are remain quite existing in terms of challenge. The first one is finance. I, I, I just want to echo what, da what David was saying because through the joint external evaluation, many of these countries are going to have national plan. And if you put all that together, we are talking about several billion dollars, which is something where funding is not obvious. So I just wanted to emphasize that because when you look at it from in the developing countries, this is a real obstacle. The second important aspect is really the implementation part. When many of the country, like the one where I live, are facing actually implementation plan in terms of preparedness, we have to see that as a process. And in this process, it implies coordinating different offers and initiatives. It implies dealing with community, which is extremely important. Because if you cannot get the community to buy to this preparedness, it is a real challenge. It's implied having a sustainability in the actions where we need to have people that are trained, which implies build, building capacity. We need to have enough people, and we, have, we need to have a good way to retain those people over a long-term period. So building sustainability is something important. The third point I see as a real challenge which is remaining is that we live in a world which is driven by crisis. And in this regard, the priority change all the time. If you look at a few weeks ago, we had a major issue with Lhasa in Nigeria. Today, we have Ebola. So those are competing, actually, priority. And when we have the same donors, the firm funded, the same people working in this constantly changing situation, this is something very, very challenging. And the last thing is really we see now in the world different major change. I mean, urbanization in Africa is one of the top of my on my list. Urbanization is going to change everything. If you look at the 2014 Ebola outbreak, the urbanization has been a key factor why the disease spread so quickly. Because we have heavily dense population facing uh, human to human transmission disease. And this is something that you cannot really handle in major cities where the infrastructure, the sanitation is not ready for that. And you make every action being implemented extremely complicated. And this urbanization on top of climate change are key issues that I think are really a serious problem on which we need to make sure that we get the country supported and have a good implementation plan to, to make that happen. Thank you. And you hit a couple of other key points that I hope we, we pick up later and I'd like to, to hear from others on and the importance of leadership and keeping this on the political agenda. And then, of course, our changing world, climate change, increasing disorder, uh, increasing risk. Um, and I think um, we're in a different place uh, than, than we have been over the past couple of decades. I'd like to turn now to Dr. Andrew Katua. Uh, Dr. Andrew Katua is an epidemiologist with more than two decades of experience in public health research, interventions, disease surveillance, prevention, and also clinical research. He was recently named the regional director for, the Afri for Africa for the USAID Preparedness and Response Project. And prior to that, he served as the project's East Africa lead. He's also served as the executive director of Tanzania's Public Health and Environmental Advancement Interventions and led malaria research for the WHO Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases. Um, he has uh, decades of experience also working with the regional disease surveillance networks, which are near and dear um, to my heart and that of my organization. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I was fortunate, actually, to work in Tanzania as the Director General of the National Institute for Medical Research, where I initiated the East African Integrated Disease Surveillance Network with the support of Rockefeller Foundation. I uh, nurtured it for five years and institutionalized it in the East African Community Desk. It's now within the East African Community. Um, looking at the issues today uh, is uh, the, the major challenges that we have and with challenges which have been with us for quite some time in country, at uh, regional level, and at global level, is investing in prevention. Uh, we tend to invest and uh, follow outbreaks and wait and react, but we don't spend enough investment to work ahead of the outbreaks to prevent, we are talking about prevent, uh, uh, detecting, uh, controlling outbreaks at source, but we spend a lot of money to respond, to wait and respond to the outbreaks. So we have to change that mentality, both at country, uh, uh, regional level, 
and national level to really put our resources to prevent. Because it is, we know, science tells us, it's the animal-human interface where things happen. And it's our knowledge of that interface, knowledge of the risks, mitigating those risks that will bring us to prevent those diseases and prevent even the epidemics that will happen. And that prevention aspect will save us millions of dollars of the interventions we are happening, we are doing today. If we spent half of that money just to prevent, we would be far ahead. So that is a saving. We should understand it as a saving. Uh, we need to strengthen our regional commitments, regional organizations, and especially regional economic organizations need to participate better, uh, to coordinate themselves better, multi-sectorally, to help countries, and to make sure that the countries really own, lead the means of solving problems. So the capacities to prevent, detect, and control out breaks at source are at the country level, but the regional has the commitment, political commitment, and the support that is needed to make those function, and also to work multi-sectorally at the regional level to help each other in t uh, when there is crisis and to learn from each other, to share resources and, and, and such things. And uh, um, at uh, the global level, I think there is need to change the aspect of uh, having funds only for uh, emergencies and also put some funds for uh, prevention and I'll talk more about that later. Great, thanks for, um, to all of our panelists for setting us up for what I hope will be a, a great conversation before we turn to all of you and in involve you hopefully uh, robustly in this conversation. So um, as we've heard throughout the program already, we find ourselves heading into this year's World Health Assembly next week in Geneva with another Ebola outbreak, um, this time again in D Democratic Republic of Congo. And we've heard um, quite a bit uh, from Lou and from Steve um, and certainly reporting in, in the news and from WHO um, about the response and, and some of the positive aspects of the response. Peter Salama nonetheless said last week, um, he's WHO's Deputy Director General in charge of um, emergency, health emergencies, said it's going to be tough and it's going to be costly to stamp out this outbreak. And, and I think that's, that's definitely true. I'd like to start by, by asking you and, and maybe starting with Amadou. Um, first, are we more prepared uh, now than we were for the Ebola outbreak in West Africa? And we've heard a lot of evidence that we are, but I, I'd love to hear um, your perspective on that. And also why it's so important to have some of the programs that we've talked about today. But second, um, in your experience, what are we, um, are we not doing that we really could be doing a better job to even improve a response like what we are, are facing today in, in DRC? What are, the, what are the surprises that we need to really avoid? Yes, uh, to the question whether we are better prepared, I strongly believe we are much better prepared. And we can have one of the, probably the most obvious, actually, indication is that if you, in 2014, it takes three months to do the detection and the confirmation of the epidemics. And this has to be done from an outside laboratory. And right now we have inside the country, within a very short period of time, the same day the sample reached the lab, the, that day we have the diagnostic. And this is really because that country is prepared. They have a lot of experience, but there are some preparations. And the fact that when it trigger these informations to WHO and all the different stakeholders, they are all line of action. And today, like less than 10 days after that, we have vaccine already there. We have visit of high top officials and World Bank and everybody is aligned to be together. And even what David was mentioning in Geneva, people are saying how they can work together. And definitely we are not in a context where there are criticism, but really joining forces. Few days after uh, we have this confirmation. Everybody is almost ready to be into the field and people are deploying. So definitely we are ready. But being ready, I mean, that doesn't mean that, as I was telling earlier, this is a process, meaning that there are still some gaps. And one thing I'm very, very optimistic about is the fact that now when it comes to research, this is a pillar of 
really the, the response itself. And I think this is a very smart and important move that we are not doing, and that hope is going to work much better this time, because in this regard, there have been preparation. If you look at different partners that are involved with that, now there is a coordination mechanism of research. You have key players and initiatives like Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations. There are different funds that are available because they want to support that research. And we should know that one of the reasons why these epidemics are difficult, besides the logistics, urban context, is the fact that we don't have enough good tools, we don't have enough information about how the disease is working. And having the research as a pillar is something that is there that we need to reinforce and that we need to deploy better. The other thing that I feel like we still have room on which we can improve, I'm always impressed by the level of technology that is existing in all different areas of the world. And the fact that those technology do not really find a way in epidemic massive like that to do contact tracing, to do some very basic info uh, activities. We have a lot of information about how people move. We have amazing smart mathematician to do mathematic modeling. But how we integrate that into what we're doing in a coordinated way is still something I think that is missing. But I'm very, very optimistic that uh, this is going in the future to play an important role. So these are, I think, the two gaps that I see still people are working on, but there is room for improvement. No, thanks. I'm optimistic too, but I, I'm also, um, I'm also uh, skeptical that we are prepared everywhere in the world as well as we might be uh, in Democratic Republic of Congo. And I'm hopeful that we're moving in the right direction. Um, David, I'd like to ask you a um, similar question, but also recognizing you've just been on the ground um, with the Australia Indos Pacific Center for Health Security and looking at several countries and what they've been doing post their J, uh, following their joint external evaluations. Um, you know, what surprised you on the ground, both positively but also places where you really think that we have work to do? You know, there were a couple of things that surprised me. Um, first was the understanding in those countries that they must strengthen not only their preparedness and their public health, but the health system that takes care of the patients who have the disease. And, and that was a major emphasis that the, that the countries themselves placed on, on, on the uh, JEE. They said that the JEE didn't bring that together, but they brought it into the JEE in order that they could join up their health systems. Second pleasant surprise was the understanding, as Andrew said earlier, of that need to do joint risk assessments between the animal community and the health, human health community. The joint risk assessments are not yet done, but they know they should be doing them, and that's a space where the Australian Center can maybe step in and help them in developing a way of doing joint risk assessment between the two groups when there is a new disease which, which shows up which comes. Um, the surprising disappointment I've already said, and that is that these countries have beautiful plans, beautiful budgeting for their plans. They show what they will contribute. They're asking the international community to contribute, and there's been nothing given. And, and this is a reflection, I think, on several things, on the, the fact that, as Andrew said earlier, the development agencies will be happy to give for a response, but it's very difficult to get that funding into preparedness and to prevention. And you know, the Ebola outbreaks occur because prevention of simple things like in preventing transmission in hospital settings is the, the reason that these occur. Ebola outbreaks don't amplify into outbreaks until they get into a health facility where transmission is amplified by poor practice. So those are the issues that have been uh, those are the issues that have come on to uh, the issue. How do you, if I can ask a follow-up question. technical problem here. If I can ask a follow-up question. If I can ask a follow-up question, how do you, how do you think that we can overcome? Financing is a, is a really one that I think many people in, in the room here are, foc are focused on. Um, there was a big infusion uh, po uh, following the Ebola outbreak uh, here in the United States of supplemental funding. That funding is, is getting ready to sunset. Other countries made very large commitments, including the G7, which committed to putting, um, to assisting 76 countries. The accounting for those commitments and then also commitments that the national countries, uh, national governments themselves uh, will make 
has just been a really tough issue, and it ties in also with the point um, that I think each of you made about keeping this issue at the top of the agenda, even in, in peacetime, and what Lou said about it being number 11 on the top 10 list every time. David, how do we, how do we fix this? What are some concrete steps? And then, I, Andrew, I'd like to ask you the same question. Well, you know, I think it's this issue of trying to change our mentality, and we all have this mentality. We want to go in, we want to stop the outbreak. What we need to do is make sure that countries have that capacity, and that capacity includes good practices in health facilities, among other things. The first Ebola outbreak occurred where there were missionary sisters who should have known better, but they weren't sterilizing their needles and their syringes. That was the first major outbreak in DRC. And the third major outbreak in DRC was the same thing. Missionaries were not doing what was necessary to show how hospital infection control can be done. And the outbreak exploded in the hospital setting. So we need to work with countries more using the resources that we've been able to mobilize globally, not to respond to outbreaks only, but during the peacetime between outbreaks, get in there and help countries strengthen their capacities. Andrew, what are your thoughts on this? You've spent a lot of time working in countries around the world on, on preparedness challenges. How do we keep this at the top of the agenda? Um, to keep this at the top of the agenda is actually to work with our governments, one at the country level, uh, to sensitize the top level uh, management, the prime minister's office and the minister's office. Uh, we have an experience with the countries that we are working with in Africa now. Uh, the first thing we did when we were developing the coordination mechanisms uh, was to work on to try and find how do we create a coordinating mechanism that allows coordination because there are tug of wars between ministries and whatnot, resources and whatnot. And we found that the prime minister was the best level for anchoring this. And we have taken step to go ministry by ministry to discuss with them why it is important and why it is important to have these mechanisms. And where we have done that, once we have done that, once they have understood, then they are supportive of the agenda. Uh, and that at country level is now taking place. We have developed strategic plans, we have developed action plans, prioritized the diseases, and based on those priorities, the strategic plan is addressing those. And in Uganda, I can tell you, the USAID mission is working with PNR now to go ministry by ministry to discuss the plan of work for sustainability that we developed and to look at how b b budgets within the ministry can actually address some of those activities. And then you can ask donors to add some more support and whatnot. But the country ownership and understanding that this is a country problem and the, we need the leadership of the country to take place. Once that takes place, things go well. At the regional level, we need then to encourage and work with the regional organizations. Uh, in the East African community, we, uh, that has been managed quite well also, that's an example, because in 2014, the uh, ministers uh, of the East African community jointly had a meeting in Zanzibar where they agreed to institutionalize One Health approach in their countries. Now, once that political resolution has gone, it's easy to work with countries and implement it at countries, and it becomes actually a competition. Uh, so working with those to make them understand why we need to invest in prevention, why we need to invest in better coordination mechanisms at country level, why this minimizes risk of getting epidemics and the economic loss, because those are economic communities. They understand why, how outbreaks devastate the economy of the countries and why we need this to mitigate those risks. Then they become participant. East African community now has requested us and we've started working with them to establish a One Health coordinating uh, platform within the East African community that will look at policies, 
that will look at support, technical support, that will look at mobilization resources and supporting countries. And I think that is how we need to move at the regional level. And of course at the global level then, uh, WHO, OIE, World Bank coordinated together and their position as conveners and countries to now dialogue with the country to support those country efforts, I think that will send us somewhere. Yeah, and I, I definitely agree that we're making progress, in, especially in countries. Um, Senegal is another great example where there's really high level support at the very top for working on health security related matters. But one thing that I wanted to bring into the conversation is this um, element of disorder in the world. So we're speaking about places where, there, where we have government and um, uh, uh, places that have been dealing with, with epidemics and like Ebola in the case of DRC. But I'd like to ask um, you, and maybe starting uh, with Amadou, how do we deal with this world of increasing disorder and biological risks that are happening in regions of conflict, fragile states, and then also just bringing in um, both Lou and um, Steve mentioned this uh, great outbreak exercise that Johns Hopkins put together um, this week called Clade X, and it was done with a bioengineer with a genetically engineered pathogen. So they, were, they played an intentional scenario, and it was interesting not just because it was an intentional scenario, but because it was unexpected. The pattern of the outbreak looked like nothing anyone uh, had ever seen, and it was happening in a place that had a very weak and fragile system. And so I, I wonder, what are some strategies that we can employ, or we, the world, I should say, governments, regions, the global community, WHO, what can we do recognizing that not every situation we're going to be able to, to, to see a strong governmental response? Yes, I think um, this, this question is very important in the sense that we may be facing those situations on a regular basis. So it's really, for me, something that needs to be tackled at the top priorities. And, and the, the possibility, I, th I think there are two or three different options. One, I think, is obviously we have to treat that from the legal point of view, make sure that we have a legal environment that would make sure, which is uh, sufficiently dissuasive for people not to go to some using some high technology to for, for an, an unexpected actually use because the well-being of science is something very important that to put forward and, and educate the scientists in this regard is important. Uh, the second area where I think we need to do a lot is really to educate scientists of those areas and engage them in a program where they would see much more value cooperating on what they know and bringing those partnerships into something that they can change at their country level. So the education of those scientists and the engagement and involving them in other areas is something I think that's, that's critically important. And the third area is really, for most of these countries, what you could see is a lack of corporations and lack of supports. And that's where in most of those weak states, what you would see is some kind of abandoning people, and abandoning those countries. So even though it's not priority, I think uh, organization like WHO or World Bank should have a very specific program for those countries. And, and I like in WHO the fact that now vulnerable people is on top of the priorities. And once again, in those areas, focusing on community is something important. Engaging them, telling them, and communicating them on a regular basis is probably the best barrier to avoid some drama that, as the one that you've seen in previous years. David, I wonder if you have thoughts on this, the, the how to deal with health security in regions where there's increasing conflict. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe also thinking about this in the context of some of the new work that WHO is getting ready to undertake um, with the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, their work with World Bank and the work with the World Economic Forum. It seems to me that there's, um, there's a lot that can be done, but also that there, there aren't perfect mechanisms for handling some of the crises that we're facing in, in places with just severe collapse of, of public health and government. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, I just follow on what Amadou said. I think that WHO is very important in these areas where there's a fragile or non-existent government. And, and that's why WHO's response is, is, is important as a safety net. 
it's not important as a primary responder. That's a country's job. But when a country can't do the job, or when for some reason it hasn't, uh, it, it hasn't used all the capacities it should have used, then WHO has to be there to mobilize the partners as it's done for the activity in, in DRC. Whether or not it's important to take in um, all the, the things which go into an outbreak today, it's not clear whether an emergency medical team is really required or whether countries can take care of their own patients if they have the resources to do it. Those are things that I'm not sure about, but they're, they're things that we have to be reconsidering in countries that have a government. But in those that don't, WHO has to go full force with that safety net that it really has. So the other part of your question had to do with Oh, I was asking more. I was asking about the context at WHO, and I just mentioned the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, and, and uh, yeah. there hasn't actually been a lot published about it. I know you, you're you're sitting in Geneva, so you may have more information than we do about it. But just recognizing that having an annual state of play for the world, you know, might shine some light on places where there needs to be more attention. Yeah, as I understand it from WHO, there there are two boards actually. There's the IOAC which is the, board, the panel that was set up by the UN after the Ebola outbreak, which is a time-limited panel, looking at the global response preparedness. And that has been functioning for a couple years. There's a new World Bank WHO monitoring board, which is being set up, which will be very high level. Their goal is not to compare countries, but to identify problems in specific countries that need attention calling that to the attention of the countries or of the international community and working with those countries to strengthen those activities. As I understand, that board will be commissioning activities uh, from different groups around the world to help them understand what the level of preparedness is, not comparing country to country, but within each country so that there can be action that's made to, to remedy that situation. So that's my understanding. Amadou may know more because he also was at the same meeting where they talked about this. Did you want to add to that? Yes, I think uh, exactly as David was saying. I think right now we have these different mechanisms, but what we really learned from that meeting and what we exchanged is really to find a good way of how we can synchronize these different mechanisms of funding epidemics. For instance, what you could realize that some fund to be triggered need a high level of death or casualty before it can be actually uh, be activated while others are really at the very beginning. So matching those two can be absolutely critical. And we have the opportunity during the meeting uh, last week to discuss uh, with uh, the WHO people in charge of the contingency funds as well as the people from the World Bank dealing with uh, the preparedness emergency funds. So, and I think finding a mechanism uh, that would make them work together in a, a very smooth manner would be beneficial for preparedness and also reactions. I agree with you, and I think one of the key challenges has just been identifying the financial resources and where they're going to come from to make that match, and also recognizing exactly you know, what countries need measurably the, the, at the highest priority level for, for preparedness and, and for um, for what they would need in, in an outbreak uh, response situation, but what they would need far upstream of that to be prepared to stop it at the source. Um, Andrew, we've been spending a, a lot of time talking about um, epidemic preparedness, and uh, Lou also mentioned this. Um, the Smithsonian is launching a new exhibit um, this week um, on uh, influenza in light of the 100 year anniversary of the 1918 uh, pandemic that killed more people than World War I. Um, Understanding that, um, that we need to be thinking about preparedness for epidemic threats, uh, we also need to be thinking top of mind about preparedness for fast-moving pandemic threats. Um, and I wanted to have your thoughts a little bit on how, you think, um, how do you think these two juxtapose with each other, the pre preparedness for an epidemic, preparedness for a pandemic, recognizing people regularly use the word um, together. And then I also wanted to ask a little bit something we were talking about earlier, um, how not only should governments be looking at this, but how do we involve the private sector um, in preparedness right. in a more effective way, not to say the private sector isn't already involved, but they, many representatives from the private sector themselves have asked me regularly this question coming out of Ebola, how can we plug in to this system that, that 
uh, brings countries and preparedness planning together to actually find a way for them to put resources in specific places. It's a big challenge. Right, yeah. Um, actually, uh, we, yes, we separate pandemic and epidemics, uh, but what we have been talking about countries' capacities to own and to coordinate better, to strengthen the systems at country levels, and to actually make sure that the capacities are always active continuously. If that happens and there is good coordination at country level and there is uh, good systems that uh, detect early and prevent at source, those countries will be better prepared in case there is a pandemic. The resources will be channeled better. There will be better conduits for resources at country level. And so the impact of those pandemics may be minimized if we have countries that are all working and coordinated better and have capacities to work uh, uh, better. But I was thinking that in that preparation, again focusing on prevention, we need, and I'm proposing that we need to look at uh, seriously on how to establish then mechanisms to fund those continuous activities. I mentioned about government budgets at country level, but at regional level, with our experiences, we can actually establish a regional prevention fund, health threat prevention fund at regional level. And with our experiences in the USA and the other countries, actually bring these uh, organizations there are capacities in countries. There are universities, there are networks, there are research institutions. So bring those capacities to a level where they can work towards preparedness and response and towards strategies for mitigating against pandemics in those countries. That is where the knowledge will be created in those countries, in those institutions, and they are there. But they are dormant. We don't have regional resources, we don't have funding, all depend on donor funding. And most of the research in those countries are depending on donor funding. So countries can contribute. I think if a few millions per country can contribute, and then the global community can add on to that, we will have a fund that is continuously addressing those issues. And we can ask it to be well monitored. Uh, we have experiences, many countries have experiences with running funds, co making calls, peer reviewing them, uh, there it will bring quality to the systems. There will be research, minimal funding, but of looking at risks, how to mitigate risks, how to uh, improve surveillance, how to link animal health and other health. And all those issues can be done with those uh, support, and that will actually help us mitigate against pandemics. If a pandemic should happen, we'll be uh, able to do. But also, working with the region, we will now have access to potential pathogens and whatnot and prepare ourselves better for vaccines. If we know uh, bats have these kind of viruses that have potentially for uh, bringing outbreak, what, we have technologies that can work on uh, th those pathogens and look at how to develop vaccines for those and then make those vaccines ready before those outbreaks come. So I, have, I want to follow up on, on one of the things that you mentioned about the importance of regional coordination. And I think all of our speakers have emphasized the importance of community engagement and yes. the importance of national health security and recognizing that sometimes when we speak about global health security, it gets um, either interpreted correctly or misinterpreted as a focus on what the global community or the donors can do and not what the countries right. themselves can do. And just following up on that thread, I think one of the challenges that, that I often face in conversations about health security is that there is this incredible focus on the need for national governments to prepare themselves and for regions to be helping one another. But, but let me ask you, um, Amadou, how important is global leadership on this topic? How important is it that the United States, that the G7 countries of the G20 also, in addition to the very important 
focus at the country level. How important is it that that this moment, at this juncture, uh, where we are um, in the in the cycle of be, of getting more prepared, coming out of the Ebola epidemic of 2014, how important is it, and and what do you see as a projected you know future for that funding and for that leadership? I think it's it's absolutely critical that these nations that are leading financially, economically the world and have much more influence on the political agenda be completely driving and get aware of making mechanisms on which better coordination would happen at the regional levels. And also, for me, it is so important because they're influencing most of the choice and driving most of the international agenda that it's very, very important that we increase their awareness. And I just want to take a couple of examples to, to just try to illustrate what I'm saying. I think it's, it's important for them, and I know most of them know that quite well, but probably in terms of detail, that when they invest into some initiatives, then the economic, and the economic uh, burden can be much less because they invest earlier. When you see a situation, for instance, the example of yellow fever. Uh, in 2016, there were a massive epidemic of yellow fever in Angola. That ended up with 11 Chinese going to China and putting the world in the discussion at the high level of WHO and emergency committee about the risk of yellow fever, which does not exist in Asia, getting into Asia and creating a massive epidemic that can be worse than Ebola. And if you look clearly at the situation, it was about having 17 million vaccine worldwide while trying to protect 500 million Chinese in a context where vector control is not working very well. And those sort of questions, I mean, are things that need to be brought at the level of discussion because there is no specific limitation why we do not have enough yellow fever vaccine in the world. And I think those questions, uh, these decision makers need to be aware because this is easy to fix. And that's where we need really a partnership between the people that are setting the rules like the government and the people that may have the knowledge to react to that like the private sector as you were mentioning earlier. And I think Driving the agenda in this regard can be extremely important. The second thing where it's important for them to be influential enough is at the many country levels, in particularly developing countries. It's quite striking when you see that if you go to some private sectors, let's say a private clinic, the way things are run is of real good standards. While the same people working in the hospital, which is public next door, is completely chaotic. So I think the, most of the government, at the level of the influence they are, the people in the G7, through their political influence, can influence that agenda. And the last thing is, we realize now that the health problem turned out to a political humanitarian uh, crisis very quickly. But most of the time, it started with a health problem. In 2014, we have Ebola in Guinea, the borders start striking, humanitarian problems start rising. And these were the things that will end up with seven billion dollar bill that is carried mostly by those countries. And that's why I think focusing on those early stage prevention, early stage uh, activities so for basic practice is very, very important. So when they do that, it's important that they focus also on the local coordination, but also at the regional coordination. Because what you see now in DRC is happening very close to a country which is Congo Brazzaville, very close to Central African Republic. It will make sense in a situation like that not to call a uh, local and regional coordination mechanism to make sure that while we're focusing on what's happening in the situation developing now in DRC, Congo is getting ready, Central African is getting ready, and the whole region is getting ready. So I wonder, we're going to open this up for questions. I'm going to ask one last that everybody can have in the front of their heads, something that they want to ask our panelists. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to ask each of our panelists, um, next week is not only the World Health Assembly, it's also a meeting of global health security experts on the margins to talk about many things, um, including the global health security agenda's next five years. If you um, 
and many of you will be at, at the assembly, what's top of mind for you and what is the one or two things that you would want senior leaders to have in the, in their, in the top of their heads on health security and related issues as they prepare? David, maybe starting with you, you're already in Geneva, you have, maybe you can give us a, a preview. Well, you know, I think that the message that we've talked about this evening is the message that they need to have. It's very important to have a global safety net if countries can't do the job themselves. And that's why we need WHO and, and partners from GORN and emergency medical teams. But the most important emphasis is on countries. And the JAE mechanism is a very important and useful mechanism. Now what needs to follow is the funding. The Joint External Evaluation Alliance has been set up. Hopefully that will be able to, if its function is to be doing this, to bring together the funding with the plans. But what's most important is to keep sustainability in mind as well and make sure that countries are not just taking the money, but that they're also contributing in a way that after five years they can fully take over, or 10 years, whatever it requires. So that, those are some of the messages I would like to see the Global Health Security Agenda and the others talk about. The leadership has been great. The U.S. was a great leader in bringing all this forward. Now other countries are taking it, which they should, and moving it ahead. There will be some political tensions, but overall it's a good activity that's going forward. The G20 had an exercise on outbreaks and was very engaged in all these activities. So I think the messages at the World Health Assembly next week need to be good job so far. Now put the money where the action should be. Great. Andrew. Um, I would uh, first of all look at the uh, global funding mechanisms today. As I mentioned previously, we need to look at prevention. I would urge the uh, global community now to think about uh, broadening the funding for emergency at global level to include funding for prevention of those emergencies so that countries can access those funds during the time when there is no epidemics and they can build those capacities which we have mentioned and use uh, uh, examples in countries like Uganda. Since October last year, it has had four outbreaks, uh, Marburg, uh, Rift Valley fever, uh, just now uh, anthrax, and we had Crimean Congo uh, hemorrhagic fever. But they were able to coordinate fast to manage, uh, prevent them at source. There's no risk to the East African community. And that gives them confidence. Now they are reporting early uh, because they, they know they have the capacity. So. Uh, it increases countries' confidence, and that country confidence increases accountability, and uh, it also uh, makes things uh, efficient uh, at, at country level. And that is the kind of support that the global community should look at, strengthening those capacities at country level. Amadeo. Yes, I think all which is done by the uh, Global Health Security Agenda, I think can be summarized in strengthening the health system. And when we talk about strengthening the health system, I think we are as strong as the weakest link, which are immunization, surveillance, and workforce. So I think if the country can be strengthened on these three things, immunization is a very good investment for the future of the kids. Surveillance would help a lot of detections. And when I say surveillance, I include labs because these are really the weakest point in all these countries. And definitely the workforce in many of those countries, doing some work, you have no career. And what we're seeing clearly is that in countries where we have not enough workforce or not enough competent workforce, that's where crisis happen. So this would be my priority. Great, so thank you all. I'd like to open it up for your questions to join the conversation. Great, uh, we'll start in the back and then we'll move our way up. I think the microphones are coming around. Great, thank you. I'm Doug Samuelson. And please, yeah, please identify yourself and your organization when you ask, thanks. President of a little consulting company called Infologix in Annandale, Virginia. You've presented a marvelous uh, analysis and summary of what we can learn from the Ebola outbreak of 2014. 
You haven't talked about what I think was the big warning shot across our bow, which was the Olympics in 2016. If we had had something like a novel flu there, with all those people in one place going back to all those countries at the same time, and the health infrastructure that was present in Brazil, it would have been worse than 1918. We know something about how well we did with containment because we, the U.S. spent a billion dollars or sent a billion dollars to Brazil to help contain Zika. Remember Zika? That wasn't I do remember a, Zika. I don't remember the billion dollars going to Zika. Well, <laughs> a lot of it was reprogrammed. It was, it was a $1.9 billion supplemental uh, appropriation request that got whittled down by the Congress. But we had a big success with Zika, right? It only spread to 47 states of the Union within two months after the Olympics. I think we need to think a lot more about containment. The politics, the legality, the funding, the natural resistance of many people and institutions to do what is advised. Uh, this is a, a very big issue and I think we're underestimating it. Yeah, um, would our panel like to comment a little bit? I think some of the issues that our, our colleague is trying to get at are, um, are just, we did learn some lessons from Ebola, but every outbreak is different and we're planning, we don't want to be planning for the, the last outbreak when we look at the next one. And certainly Zika was a big surprise to many of us in the White House on the margins of Ebola at the time. So um, thoughts, Amadou, please. Yes, concerning Zika, I just want to mention two things that are to me very important. In my lab, we were working in Zika like in 2007. We developed all sort of tools for Zika. So when the Zika started in Brazil, we are one of the few labs and CDC for Collins that have tools for Zika. The reason was very simple, is that we had very good surveillance that show from 1968 up to 2007, we are having Zika outbreak every other year. So. It was not as harsh as this happened in Southern America, but the point I'm trying to make there is that if you have good surveillance in area where those things happen, then we may be ready for the disease X. Somewhere would have some, someone on somewhere would have some right to at least to start at the beginning. And when we, when we went to Brazil to support the government uh, and the Sao Paulo states, within two, three weeks, all the tool was transferred to them and they were moving into doing research cooperatively. And we came up with some very interesting results like showing the causality between the Zika and the microcephaly. What I'm trying to say is that, is that obviously we're gonna have things that we really didn't really plan. But to today, I think the world have enough technology capacities to be able to build a resilient system. This is number one thing I wanna say. And the second thing that I wanted to say is that when it comes to Zika, I remember uh, being a member of the emergency committee that was chaired by David, where we discussed very seriously all the issues, including Olympic Games. And clearly what I like the, uh, about Zika is even though for Ebola, WHO was having some trouble, uh, with Zika they reacted much earlier, and at some point even people were saying, oh, did they really react, did, did they did really overreact? What I'm trying to say is obviously uh, containment can be important. We're gonna face different other things. But if you work out the mechanism that we have now, which is IHR, which is emergency committee, which is all this advisory group, and the amount of technology we have, we can easily build a resilient system. I don't think we're gonna be prepared for everything, but we can be reacting very well because if we threaten just the things that we we're mentioning, having a good surveillance and good partnership with people that have the knowledge and the capacity like the industry and the public bodies. There are a few others. Um, I'll start on this side if I could and then move back in. Uh, yep. Yeah. Hi, I'm John Kivashi. I'm contract support for Department of Homeland Security. Um, so, and also I'm, in, I'm also in public health. Um, so I had a question based on your experience, your personal experiences, what have you found more challenging, um, engaging governments to invest on preventing disease outbreaks or kind of more boots on the ground of engaging the public on engaging them and, and making sure they're educated and aware um, I think, you know, with public health, there's 
so many stakeholders involved, so it's kind of hard on when, who to start, you know, bottom up or top down. Thank you. Andrew, did you want to start? I saw you nodding. Yes. I, uh, I think both have been uh, uh, challenges, but we see the light now because uh, in the countries where I've been working, where I'm still working uh, in Africa, we have engaged the governments and as I mentioned now, with the strategic plans that have been developed and whatnot, governments are now looking at how they can contribute their budgets to those, uh, to the, to the, to those plans. As long as they own those plans, they are built on national priorities and involving the government, involving all the partners in a transparent way and looking then into realistic, what are the issues, what are the activities, and then looking at how, what can you then as government contribute, which activities. Uh, we are working now with six sectors, so what are you going to do with, uh, in agriculture, in uh, veterinary, in, medis in medicine, what? So engagement, we, I think we have not seriously engaged sometimes. We have tended to do things for, rather than let me help you to do things for yourself. Wake up, I want you to do those things. I will help you, I'll give you the technical know-how, but less work. And streamlining those to the district level and community level. Yeah, we, so we are doing poor at community level in surveillance and what. We need to strengthen those. But it's not difficult. When you talk with communities, they know, they understand, and they have their own local interpretations. It may be sometimes erroneous, and that's the opportunity to, to educate them then and to work with them. That's where anthropology, social science needs to be. And this is what happened with Ebola in West Africa, but we have to learn from that, and let's use it now. It's, it's, it's challenging, but it's doable. Uh, I can say it's, it's, it's doable. Great, we had a couple in the middle. Uh, we'll start in, yep, second row right there. Do a couple more in the back and then the right, and how much time do we have? A couple minutes, okay, great. I can take, I think, two more questions after this, and then I think we'll have to cut it. I'm Dave Robinson. I worked with World Vision in uh, West Africa in the Ebola response. Um, I'd like to hear your comments on the role of faith leaders in terms of in community engagement, as you mentioned, Andrew, just at the end there. Um, trust of the messages coming from the Capitol was a big problem. Uh, resistance to those messages over the mass media. Uh, fear blocked a lot of people, and particularly in the burial issues. Um, building trust in the role of civil society leaders like faith leaders, imams, pastors, priests, etc. Would, uh, how is that part of the solution moving forward, taking that lesson from Ebola? Yeah, and maybe if, our, if, if you want to start, Andrew, maybe just really briefly so we can fold yep. in two more questions before we have to close. Right. I, yes, there are uh, um, uh, a lot of issues in, 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 in that context. And there are issues uh, when we don't engage them seriously and explain and work with them that we are not going against your faith, but we are going to... Uh, make things safer. A burial uh, uh, ceremonies and rituals, uh, we, we told them not to bury, we will do it for you. We'll, but if we had engaged them to say, this is not safe, we will work with you and this is how safe it is to do, and allow them to give the respects, but in a safer way, not uh, in the normal ways they would have been more cooperative and whatnot. But when uh, they believe so much in uh, the last respects and whatnot, and now you are not allowing me to even see my father and whatnot, uh, who is dead and whatnot, they hide. So that understanding between ourselves and, and themselves and not, uh, not belittling their knowledge or saying this is um, a nonsense, there is no nonsense. It's, let's understand them and let's make them understand us so that we talk and we can now convince them that what we are doing is right because it will help you also to do the right things. In your, I'm not against your religion, but we will do the right things to protect people and you want to protect people. So that dialogue and that, and that needs a lot of social 
uh, anthropology work at the community level and whatnot. And this is what we can do in peacetime, not when there is an outbreak. When there is an outbreak, there is panic. And the time to engage with a, a, a priest or a, a traditional healer is not there. It, they act as, as they know at that time. But during peacetime, as we engage, we have time to engage because there is no risk, there is no problem. That's the time to engage with those people. Yeah, I think I heard more people during the Ebola outbreak talk about the experience with anthropologists and, and people who really had an understanding of how communities work and why that was so in incredibly um, underrepresented in our, yeah. our previous outbreak thinking. I don't know if Amadou or David want to respond to that question. Um, if yes, fine. If not, we can take one more. Up to you. So okay, I we'll could just yep. yep. Go ahead, David. Go ahead. So okay. I would just say that um, faith healers and also volunteers in the community are extremely important, and that's where the emphasis has to be. Many of the outbreaks that I've been participating in have started the response through the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, or even some of the faith leaders, because the government in many instances disappears and those who are taking care of patients disappear. And it's left to the community volunteers to do it, and they do do it. They take it up and they do it. So community resilience is at the base of everything. I just wanted to say that it's probably the most challenging part is talking to the community. And faith, for me, is something that can be extremely useful when used appropriately. It has been damaging. Uh, this morning I was taking part to a conversation where people are discussing what can be the impact of Ramadan in the success of this vaccine in the Muslim community now in DRC? So these are the things where probably the leader, the religious leader, can be extremely important in bringing the right questions to the community and being part of the response. So bringing them to collaboration is for me extremely comp uh, important and critical to the success. As far as the trust is, is concerned, I think this is very, very complicated this process. And what I learned through Ebola is that depending on your entry point, you may miss it very, very widely. Uh, because in some area, what I've seen is talking to the young people would be much more impactful. Why in the community next door, talking to religious people was the right entry point, or talking to the leader of women. So I think that's what that part that is difficult because you cannot have a one size fit all to build trust or really use faith for to reach your target. So I apologize, we're gonna have to close there in order to make time for our next speaker who I know you all wanna hear from. And I just wanna take a second to thank our panelists, um, Dr. David Heyman, Dr. Amadou Sal, and Dr. Amadou Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, while we get the podium in place, I just wanna say a few words of introduction. I also want to acknowledge Dan Lucy, who's, who's here with us. Dan is um, at Georgetown University, and during the course of the Ebola outbreak in 2014 and into 15, he was back and forth uh, uh, doing extended uh, service in both Liberia, Sierra Leone, and in the midst of that, came up with this vision and this concept of an exhibit and began during his brief stints back here in town, consulting with people and making the case. This idea forward and being very fastidious in, 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 in helping people imagine what it could look like, raising the funds, and then working very cooperatively with the experts, Sabrina and her team, who did this marvelous job of putting this stunning exhibit together. So just to acknowledge, Dan, your, your contribution. Um, Sabrina uh, is the curator of this exhibit. She's an anthropologist. She's the head of anthropology at the museum. She does a lot of work on environmental health, on history, and the, and the historical roots of these natural phenomena. Um, uh, she was uh, uh, very clever in planning for the uh, rollout of this exhibit at the time of the outbreak in DRC. 
she was very clever at getting 450 people into the museum last night for a very energized and dynamic celebration of all of the great work that she and the other uh, designers uh, brought into this entire effort. I think we need to understand the magnitude of this achievement. We have not had an exhibit of this kind at a major American institution like the Natural History Museum, which has a throughput of American and non-American civilians in the millions per year. And so the potential, the teaching potential for this is just extraordinary and it's unprecedented. So congratulations, Sabrina, to you for this and to your colleagues and all of those people that you have drawn on in putting this together. This is a project that I believe is going to be with us, an exhibit for, I think, three years, which is also stunning and really encouraging. So please, thank you so much. Congratulations, and thank you for being with us. Okay, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Steve, I do have to say I'm not the head of anthropology uh, in my department, but I am a curator um, of biological anthropology. I'm very pleased to see my colleague, Dan Lucy, here. I didn't realize that he was here, uh, but that's perfect. I think that, um, a lot of uh, what I want to say has already been introduced. Um, but I'll start off, uh, for those of you who don't know, I represent uh, the Smithsonian, um, the Smithsonian Institution, which is the US um, funded uh, uh, science and museum complex, uh, the largest of its kind in the world. Uh, we represent 19 museums and research centers, and I'm a curator at the Natural History Museum uh, um, which is the largest among them. In fact, it's the largest natural history museum in the world. And so Steve just briefly mentioned how many visitors we actually get. Um, I think it's around 7 million per year. Uh, and for any of you who haven't been among those visitors lately, uh, this is what the museum looks like on the inside. Maybe, maybe that's familiar. Um, our mission at Natural History is understanding the natural world and the place of humans within it. Uh, so when you know, Dan proposed this idea um, at the height of the Ebola epidemic in West Africa in 2014, um, it really seemed like the most important um, and appropriate story that we could tell um, because we're understanding humans um, in a rapidly changing natural world. And um, to provide the kind of ecological context that I, I feel that um, we could uh, really um, present for those who are unfamiliar with all those circumstances uh, seems like a really powerful opportunity. Uh, not just to talk about Ebola, um, but to talk about emerging infectious diseases, to really help the public understand um, you know, what causes them, um, how they spread, and potentially what we can do to stop them, um, and prevent them um, by understanding that most of these um, emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic. Uh, many of them are viruses and many of them originate in wildlife. So um, that is a lot of what people are going to learn about um, in the outbreak exhibit, which opens tomorrow um, and will be open for three years. I think that what's going to come across very clearly and what's our, our main message um, with this exhibit, um, going back to our mission as a museum, um, you know, seeing that humans are not separate from the natural world. Um, human health is not separate from the health of the natural world. And so we present these challenges and these threats um, in the context or in, with the idea um, from the perspective of One Health that human and animal and environmental health are connected. And so by raising awareness about those connections um, and you know, the role of humans um, in changing the interactions that increase our pandemic risks, um, that perhaps we can empower people and uh, better equip them to be more um, you know, responsive um, and understanding of these issues when they arise, but then also possibly to be better informed about ways that can change the behavior to prevent them. So I'm going to walk through a few slides um, with you know, the brief amount of time that I have just to give you guys some idea of the ways that we're engaging our visitors, how we present information um, in ways that we think can be very um, effective 
um, and with um, various techniques that can be quite impactful uh, with the you know, minutes that we have with them potentially um, and the many ways that different people learn. So One Health is a concept that is introduced early in the exhibit, um, and you know, it's introduced in, in ways that include um, you know, showing the uh, specimens from our collections and natural history um, to uh, you know, uh, illustrate the, the diversity of hosts in wildlife and domestic animals of zoonotic viruses. Um, also to reinforce that triad, to always be pulling apart the human, animal, and environmental factors that um, contribute to any particular outbreak, um, which we've featured throughout the exhibit, um, and better understanding you know, those different roles and, and processes. Uh, and finally, you see a motif throughout the exhibit when you look at these rails that you see in front of these large images. Um, you know, those rails have a lot of information, a lot of facts. Um, that's what we do at our museum, we present science. Um, but also, we've chosen to uh, create this uh, theme of on the upside. We want to create a very positive exhibit. Uh, we don't want to paralyze people with fear, even though pandemic risks are frightening and serious. Um, we want them to uh, be aware of uh, positive um, uh, findings or efforts, initiatives, um, and things to be a bit more, um, uh, I think, um, uh, readied about when, uh, when they encounter this information elsewhere. So we go through the exhibit hall um, showing, highlighting different stories. We've, we've chosen a handful of zoonotic viruses that are particularly effective in illustrating the One Health concept. And so for the concept of spillover, right, wildlife to humans, in this section, for example, we're talking about the spillover Nipah virus in Bangladesh um, with smaller highlights about hantavirus in the four corners of the U.S. and then uh, HIV um, in Africa. We always want to be showing geographic diversity and cultural diversity um, to make people aware that you know, these can happen anywhere, these outbreaks, um, and that you know, it's relevant for everyone. Uh, when we talk about international spread, going from an outbreak to you know, people being infected and getting on planes, uh, we talk about uh, the outbreak of SARS in 2003. Um, and you'll see in the last slide, and then in this one, and in the others, um, in case I forget to point them out, we have a lot of audiovisual features, multimedia, um, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, short pieces that we think are really effective in um, conveying complex ideas um, and quite uh, lengthy stories um, in a space that people can really uh, comprehend. When we get to the uh, story of a pandemic, even though we do open you know, this year at the centenary of the 1918 influenza pandemic, we have chosen to make HIV um, the story of the pandemic of our time. And so on a the wall there, we've got four decades of science and healthcare and activism and policy change uh, representing the epidemic in this country. And then also on that table there, that's an interactive table, and that's where people can actually see um, how different regions um, in the world today are doing, uh, working towards their 1990-90 goals um, as put forth by UNAIDS. When we're talking about actually responding in the field, you know, things that, the kind of work that we're talking about right now, what we're showing people is the Ebola treatment unit, um, and also emphasizing the role of not only healthcare workers, but the community. Um, in adopting safe burial practices and breaking the epidemic curve. Here's a, it's a very dark photo, so it's impossible to take a good photo um, in our hall, certainly not at the time when we were still designing it last week. Um, but this is an interactive game, three players. You get to assume different roles of different paths in animal health or environmental health or lab work. Um, going through identifying what's causing an outbreak to uh, where did it come from to how can we stop it from spreading. Um, and I've identified a couple of the you know, very talented and important people on my exhibit team uh, that I represent here today. Uh, here we just show some of our collections, the ways that we at our museum are involved and relevant for the kind of research that is uh, related to the problems we're we're talking about today, um, going back from our bird specimens from around the time of the pandemic, uh, to the way that we are collecting and accessioning, um, you know, uh, specimens from surveillance, um, as well as utilizing the archaeological record to better understand the origins of some of the diseases um, that we still are challenged with. Uh, here we see some more audiovisual uh, features, games, um, and other ways to conceptualize and engage our audiences, especially our younger visitors. Um, in these concepts. 
and here we have a section about survivors. Um, we're focusing here on Ebola and HIV and a couple of stories about flu. And I think that this is a very powerful part of the exhibit and unexpected for a natural history museum. Um, you know, I'll just say that the two objects that you see here, that book, that's a picture book, a photo book, um, a scrapbook uh, created by Jeannie White uh, that features photos of her son Ryan. And it actually, um, I think, really nicely encapsulates uh, what he faced, um, being infected with HIV and then not being allowed to go to school. That bullhorn um, was used by Cleve Jones um, when he uh, had the inspiration um, of the um, of the, the AIDS quilt um, and uh, the memorial AIDS quilt. And it was given to him by his mentor, um, Harvey Milk. And so I think it's the quintessential um, symbol of activism um, and fighting against infectious diseases. And here uh, we see a timeline, you know, as being an anthropologist and looking into the past um, and how it can inform us. You know, I, I felt it was very important for people to recognize that the kind of behaviors and activities that are driving the emergence of disease, you know, that um, those have been increasing, intensifying over a much deeper period of time than most people realize. Uh, but as they've increased, we have seen an increase of our pandemic risks and how many more ep epidemics uh, that we're seeing in the world today. And then finally, you know, wanting people to have the best information that they can and recognizing that we can only stay so nimble given that, you know, we're printing material that probably won't change. We've uh, had the, the great fortune um, of support from ProMed and HealthMap for a special version of the HealthMap website uh, so people can know what's happening in the world today. Uh, so finally, I'll just let you know that uh, we are doing a lot of programming related to the exhibit uh, for the next three years, uh, bringing in experts who can engage directly with our audiences um, in different ways to give them the information they need. Uh, we have a volunteer core that's been trained by uh, our network of experts so that they can have conversations um, about uh, these issues with the public. That's Ashley Peary, our, our volunteer trainer and educator. Uh, we are doing surveys to find out where people are getting their information, what sources they trust, what they know and what they don't know, um, where they see stigma or, or risk, um, and how we can have better conversations with our visitors based on that information. Robert Costello, uh, one of our educators, has been um, in charge of that effort. And finally, um, the last piece that I'll talk about, particularly because it's just come up in our conversation here about how you engage the public and particularly the communities um, on issues and you know, things that, ways that they can be uh, best informed and prepared for outbreaks. Uh, we are making a version, we've made a version of this exhibit. Uh, it's going to be uh, available tomorrow as a set of files uh, that's available to anyone for free. Um, 15 panels that we've made that distill the content I've just pre pre um, presented to you, uh, but also templates uh, which people can use to uh, customize their own exhibits that are not, not made by us or vetted by us, but actually um, putting those priorities and those stories in those communities in their own words. Uh, we're also providing uh, versions of the multimedia that I've described here, again, all for free, as well as a resource guide to really best equip communities to do their own versions of the outbreaks, because we certainly can't know um, what would be most effective for them, and we can't expect them to come to Washington and see ours. Uh, this is what one version of that pop-up exhibit looks like, just those panels, which uh, debuted at PMAC um, uh, earlier this year. Um, th in that show, there was a customized panel, which we had nothing to do with, um, about the uh, outbreak of MERS in Thailand in 2015. And this is already where the outbreak is spreading among early adopters who are interested to know more about this project and bring it to their communities. Audrey Chang is in charge of this project and we can, can contact it if anyone is interested in doing more. And finally, to recognize the support that we've had, so much support from so many people um, from your community. Um, you know, uh, those, those organizations are here and certainly a couple individuals who we, without whom we could not have done, done any of this. Um, Dan Lucy um, and then John Epstein has been a great science advisor to the core team. Um, and again, uh, I'm an anthropologist, I work in a museum, but to tell your stories and about all the good work that you do required support um, from a much broader network of people. Uh, we open next tomorrow, <laughs> and, uh, but, and we go viral, so to speak, on social media next week. Please stay engaged, talk to us. We want to talk to you, and we're very excited to have this new role in this conversation. Thank you.
Thank you so much, and congratulations. Um, as we, when we started, um, I, I mentioned that this is a partnership. Uh, we enjoy the sponsorship for this event from both uh, DAI and from uh, the Fondation Merieu. I'd like to invite Chris Legrand and, and Guy Vernet to come up on stage, offer some closing remarks, and welcome us to the next stage of our celebration here. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Legrand. I am the president of DAI Global Health, uh, headquartered out here in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, we've been blessed to be able to be a co-sponsor of this event uh, with the lead sponsor, CSIS, and thanks again, Steve, for all of your work. And also our partners, uh, Fondation Merieu and uh, the USAID Preparedness and Response Program, uh, which you've seen a little bit of this afternoon. Special thanks today also for uh, Luciana Boro as, as our keynote speaker, for Sabrina for uh, your sharing the Smithsonian uh, information. That's a really awesome exhibit. I can't wait to go see that. Uh, to, uh, to Beth Cameron for uh, your uh, able uh, putting together of the panel and, and your great questions. Those were great questions uh, also from the audience. And again, Steve, uh, to you and your organization uh, for really making all of this happen. We're also pleased and honored to have one of our own, Andrew Katua, here from the field. Uh, Andrew is a DAI uh, staff person out in the field uh, involved in the preparedness and response program. And it's a good example of, a, of a, an experienced practitioner at work in the field day to day um, and the kind of special insight that he can bring about country ownership. And I think you heard him speak to that uh, very passionately. And I had the opportunity to go see that uh, firsthand in Andrew's work in, uh, in Uganda and now, and now covering the entire African continent for us. Um, also thanks to, uh, to Amadou and David for your great work on the panel. It was great to hear your insights. Just a few words about DAI Global Health and why we are a co-sponsor of this event. Um, we have been involved uh, as DAI in, um, in this area of One Health really uh, for many, many years, and uh, you might, might not have known that, but really coming at the nexus of animal health, environmental health, and human health, and the importance of really coming upstream and seeing what the impacts are before where, where we can catch those earlier, that's really an important part of, of what DAI Global Health is involved in, so we're really honored to be part of that, and again, excited to see the exhibit um, the, at the Smithsonian. So, uh, you know, after, after looking at this 100 years of, of progress that we've, that we've been making on being able to better uh, predict and respond to outcomes, we're look, uh, to outbreaks, we're looking now at the next 100 years and, uh, and being able to, uh, to work at, at the governance level, at the systems level, and more importantly, at the human capacity level, really enhancing the workforce and the human capacity in country to be able to deal with and epidemics and pandemics when they do occur, and they will occur again, as we all know. Um, this planet is changing. I think we all ex uh, recognize that the breakneck speed of urbanization and globalization around the world and the effects of, of the ecosystems that we all live in um, are going to impact not the, way, not the way that we deal with pandemics in the past, but that we deal with pandemics in the future. Um, and so that's a critical piece that we recognize things like the urbanization that happened and the Im impact that that had on, on how fast Ebola spread in 2014. So we have to be talking about that now as a community. I think we all get that, but we need to go back out into our own communities, into the, into the organizations that we're involved in, and make sure that we continue to raise that as an important piece of what we need to understand about the globalization and urbanization of, what, of, of our society that's not going back. So we've been proud and honored to be, as DII Global Health, part of this event today, part of, of sharing the conversation, part of helping to influence that conversation, and to help shape the dialogue going forward on what real country ownership means, on what real preparedness looks like, and being able to, to, to deal with, with improving the health systems in countries where we, where we live and work and operate, and ultimately that workforce that is going to deliver better health outcomes to all. Thanks again to CIS, CSIS for uh, your work on this event, and uh, on to Keith for uh, closing our remarks. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our speakers, um, uh, our moderator, our, our, our panelists for joining us today and uh, sharing their insights with us. I would like uh, in particular to share those who uh, have traveled from uh, far away to uh, attend this uh, event and, uh, and David Eman to do it remotely and uh, David is the chair of our board here in the, in the US. I would like also to thank our uh, co-sponsors, uh, DAI and the Preparedness and Response Program from uh, USAID, and our hosts, CSIS, Steve um, and his team for uh, their work in uh, making this event possible. And of course, the uh, audience of today, which is uh, very broad and uh, which means that this topic of uh, pandemic preparedness is uh, of uh, real importance. The Merrier Foundation is very proud to be uh, part of this event because pandemic preparedness is uh, at the heart of our preoccupations, not only during crisis, but also uh, between crises. And I will take um, a moment to introduce our organization because um, which uh, some of you may not be uh, familiar with. Fondation Merieux is a family foundation that was created in France over 50 years ago and which has now uh, sister foundations here in the US, but also in China. And uh, all, of, all three foundations share the same mission of fighting infectious diseases in, uh, in low resource countries. I lead the, foundation, uh, the Merieux Foundation USA, which is uh, headquartered here in DC. And we work to engage American partners in collaborative projects that respond to a variety of global health needs more specifically those which are related to diagnostics, to laboratory, and to disease surveillance. We strongly focus on vulnerable populations, such as refugees in Lebanon and in, uh, in Bangladesh, and mothers and children in many low-income countries. And we work to increase their access to a good quality diagnostics, which in turn improve their health outcomes. We contribute to global health security by advancing our partners' countries' preparedness and response capabilities to uh, epidemics and to pandemics. Always, and this is very important, working with the ministries of, of health to ensure that country-specific needs are met and gaps are filled. We enhance research capacities. Research is very important in low-resource countries, enabling local scientists to perform high-quality research on infectious diseases of local importance and to engage in multicentric studies to uncover causes of devastating diseases such as respiratory infections in small children. Lastly, we enable cross-border knowledge sharing amongst public health professionals on the best ways to prevent, to diagnose, and to treat infectious disease. The Merrier Foundation USA is fortunate to be able to leverage the dedication and expertise of Foundation Merrier staff over a third of this staff is based in partner countries. And on the generosity and long-standing commitment of the Merieu family, which provides Fondation Merieu with roughly half of its annual revenues. Given our French heritage, most of our work has historically been focused on francophone countries all over the world. Alongside external financial partners, primarily from Europe and North America, Fondation Merieu is able to commit roughly 80% of its resources every year to fulfill a number of uh, impactful projects. Recently, for example, we have built and refurbished clinical laboratories and lab technician training centers in Benin, in Guinea, in Niger, in Laos, and in the Amazon region of uh, Brazil. Through the West African clinical laboratory network Rezaolab, which spans seven countries. We support national authorities to assess and strengthen their laboratory capacities. We have also worked with our local partners to build a number of laboratories with adapted biocontainment capacities that enhance biosecurity and biosafety, BSL-2 Plus and BSL-3, in Beijing and in nine other places in Africa, the Middle East, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. We have also built the, the French BSL-4 laboratory in, uh, in Lyon. And we continue to conduct collaboratory research projects with some two dozen partner institutions around the world, which encompass the Gabriel Network, 
enabling these scientists to combine their efforts in studying the infectious disease that fuel public health threats. If you are interested in learning more about our foundation and its work, I'd invite you to pick up a brochure on the welcome table outside or to visit our website. And I invite you to join the reception, which is right behind you. And thank you again for attending this uh, exceptional event. So we're adjourned. Please join us.